so good evening everybody and a very big welcome to you all whether you are joining us in person here in the Chow Chat Wing Museum or whether you are joining us online uh, from a number of different places across the world I mean certainly here in Sydney and elsewhere in Australia but also from Canada from the US from the UK and Greece it's a great pleasure to have your company. My name is Associate Professor Leslie Beaumont, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you this evening Professor Meg Miller's wonderfully entitled lecture, From Prairie to Antipodes, A Life in Ruins. But it is a pleasure that is tinged with sadness because it's this evening that we formally mark Meg Miller's retirement from the University of Sydney, and I am going to miss her. Meg arrived at the University of Sydney to take up her position as the Arthur and Rene George Professor of Classical Archaeology in June 2005. And since then, We've collaborated closely in teaching and in research, and particularly in recent years in the co-directorship of the Zagora Archaeological Project, together with our colleagues Davros Paspalas and Paul Donnelly. Now, I don't want to say too much about Meg's illustrious career, because we're going to hear all about that this evening. But I do just want to acknowledge two things. First of all, her scholarship, her outstanding scholarship in classical archaeology, and her trailblazing work in exploring East-West international and intercultural relations in antiquity, as well as the representation of ethnicity in Greek art and the social signification of dress in antiquity. The second thing I want to acknowledge is her humanity and her humility. Meg has never been someone who, because of her elevated professional status, has been a distant figure. She has never isolated herself from her colleagues or her students. Instead, she's always been someone concerned to connect with others. She's been compassionate and nurturing and supportive. Her warmth and support has been extended to many people over the years, including me. And on behalf of us all, I want to say, Thank you, Meg. So without more ado, I would like to invite Meg to give her talk, which will be followed by a vote of thanks by Professor Stephen Garton. And then we have a little surprise for Meg. So I just ask you to all stay seated after Professor Garten's vote of thanks. And after that, we will offer some refreshments in the museum's cafe. So Meg, without more ado, I'm dying to hear what you've got to tell us. Oh, am I too far? I love this portable desk idea. Look, thank you so much, Leslie, for your welcome. It's, it's been such a pleasure, um, oh, in so many ways, to be here and to be at the department uh, and working with, with all of you. I'll get into that later. But I, I should say, uh, to be asked to talk about my past experience, field experiences, was a bit of a challenge. I mean, it starts back in 1978, and I, I, I have strong memories of certain very concrete things uh, but the big picture is not, has been hard to capture. And I've had fun the past few weeks trying to find the publication reports of the various projects I've worked on. It's been very interesting. Um, I should say that, alas, I seem to have thrown away a lot of my slides when we emptied my quadrangle office, and I thought they would be no longer useful. 
So um, some of my experiences have very little, shall we say, visual record. So yes, from Prairie to Antipodes, A Life in Ruins, um, that wasn't my brilliant idea, it was somebody else's this title, but it works well because that's basically me. Um, I also have a subtitle, if I could click the forward. Oh, it's not working. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Wanderings of a Prairie Girl in Search of Ancient Remains. You see, yes, I come from parts of Canada that are wide open. I grew up in Alberta, a small town called Innisfail, just east of the Rockies, with wheat fields all around us. You could play hide and seek amidst the rows of grain because it was so tall, we were so small. Um, and the sky is very big. It's really beautiful. It's, 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 it's awe-inspiring countryside. And yes, this is the poem that goes with it. I won't sing it to you. I was going to, but I don't feel quite my musical self today. Give me a home where the buffalo roam and the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. These two photographs absolutely do not prove that right. And now, not to worry, that is what it should be. There should be no clouds ever in summertime. And then winter comes, there are clouds and snow, and it's wonderful. So the Americans call these the Great Plains, and it's full of openness. It's full of sky. It goes on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. And the little individual feels very um, small in that environment. There's very little evidence of human interaction on the environment. Anyhow, we left the plains, and then we moved to northern Alberta, the great northern bush. Lovely landscape, incredibly beautiful as well. Uh, mostly, mostly uh, evergreens, but you can see there's the odd coniferous, but the odd a tree that change colors in, in autumn. It can be very beautiful, connected by the rivers that go through it. In fact, the major thing when I was growing up in Portland Murray was the, the winter uh, dog sled race uh, from, uh, from Tuck down to Fort Murray. It was fun. Anyhow, but um, it's, it also has a song which I won't sing to you, Land of the Silver Birch, Home of the Beaver, Where Still the Mighty Moose Wanders at Will and so on and so forth. It's magnificent, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, but it's again, very, very full of nature, wide open for hundreds of miles. This is what you get. And for uh, until very, very recently, the only way you get anywhere there was by the rivers because there were no roads. Uh, anyhow, there we are. It was lovely, but I kind of felt, I kind of felt that um, nature was too overwhelming and too wonderful, too, too much. I wanted something that had maybe uh, history of humans, humans and their interaction with, with their landscape. And so I thought what I'd do is I'd study classical archaeology, uh, that, uh, several steps on the way, and I thought the first step to do was to study classics. Yes, I should learn Greek and Latin and ancient history and all the background information to help me come to grips with ancient Greece. And so I went to the University of British Columbia, famous because it's right beside Wreck Beach in Vancouver. Now, for those of you who don't know, Wreck Beach is the one legal new to speak Beach, probably in all of North America. That's why it's famous. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, um, nobody knows how this started. I think it was back in the 60s, of course, you know, when things like that started. But um, there, there I took part in the Department of Classics. I did honors classics. And here's a photograph of my fellow students and myself uh, on a significant occasion. The, the uh, Vancouver Sun uh, newspaper wanted to take a picture of us all. So a photographer came and said, oh, you know, uh, I need to be symmetrical. So he put me in the middle. And then they thought that wasn't symmetrical, so they put the sculpture bust beside us. God knows who that person is. And then they thought, no, it doesn't look academic enough. Get, get a book. So we brought out the big, the Del Scott Jones uh, lexicon of Greek and had me hold it to look very serious and intellectual. Now, um, I trust you could recognize me. Some of you may recognize the character on the left. It's Eric. Yeah, you're right. It's Eric. He was a fellow student, and that's what he looked like as a young man. <laughs> Harrier. Uh, basically, yeah. Okay, so at the University of British Columbia, I had the most extraordinary uh, fellow students, yes, but also instructors. I had the most amazing uh, people teach me Greek, Latin, history, mostly Greek and Latin. I didn't do much history there, but uh, they included two who were especially important to me, and that's Tony Barrett on the left and Dick Sullivan on the right. And they were especially important to me because they helped me with my next step. Animation's not happening. Firm, Meg, firm. We can do this. Ah, yes. <laughs> it, it took time, but they helped me get to Oxford. Um, they, um, uh, Dick managed to, to um, uh, uh, help me uh, find the right college to go to. He was 
he had worked there himself and, and um, he founded a wonderful women's college, St. Hughes College, it's now co-ed. I wanted a women's college because one day when I was doing my Greek, I was sitting at my desk and I was, I was um, um, imagining my future as a scholar. And I was imagining myself smoking a pipe and stroking my beard. And I thought to myself, this is not the right kind of image to have for yourself. You've got to change your subconscious expectation of what, sorry, good for the field, but not for here, um, of, what, of what scholars do. So I wanted to go to women's college and Tony got me to St. Hughes, that was great. Now, what was Dick's role in this? Well, Dick was a researcher. He had a big research a grant from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and sure. And uh, he um, hired me to be a research assistant to help him get things in Oxford that he couldn't get at home. In other words, he gave me the money that I could buy food while I was there. That was so good. Yeah. Um, this one. Third time lucky? Fifth time lucky. Maybe I do want your keyboard. <laughs> Am I aiming it in the wrong direction? I can go back. Ah, forward. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> right. So Tony, uh, right. Tony was amazing in many ways. So he was a you know, great Latin teacher. He taught me Latin. That's fine. But he uh, spent his winters at the University of British Columbia writing books on the notorious founding members of the Roman imperial family. So Agrippina and people like that. But he spent his summers excavating Romano-British sites in Britain. And uh, he especially went worked at the Lunt, where he was co-director for many years and, and published it recently. Now, the Lunt, when he was working there, did not look like this. This is the modern restored version. What he was digging was a big empty field full of dirt. And uh, this is the, uh, as you can see, the modern construction of it. But Tony knew I wanted to study archaeology. And when I was in England, he advised me to go to the University of Birmingham Field School run by Graham Webster at Roxeter, a Romano-British site. Now, Graham Webster is the, the, basically the godfather of Romano-British studies. He created the discipline and worked at Roxeter for many, many years. Um, he, I show here just a photograph of, of what it looked like a long time ago, not when I was there, and where Roxeter is. So I was, I was at that point in the middle of summer of my two years of my second two-year BA in Oxford, and it was the perfect opportunity to get out there and actually dig. It was so exciting, very exciting. Now, the, uh, I was told as equipment to take for this excavation, what I needed was a line level and a, a an iron, cast iron pointing trowel with a forged tang four and a half to five inches long. So I went to the shops in Oxford to find such a thing. But in fact, I'm afraid this all sold out, and all I could get was a two and a half inch trowel uh, uh, with a forged tang. And I armed my, with my trowel, I went off to excavate. Right, so it was a wonderful experience. Um, but the experience basically I remember most vividly is very sore wrists because I was troweling through this really, really heavy clay material with my mini trowel. Um, and it's, um, I, they called it PP. Now, I um, understand PP stands for plum pudding. And plum pudding is called that because it has a variable color texture. And, um, and I thought, well, that's what all the English people call their, their interesting clay constructions. But more recently, I learned when the English people told me they knew they'd never heard of PP. Actually, it was Graham Webster's term for this precise phenomenon of constructions made from predominantly of mud that decay into plum pudding. So it's Graham Webster who figured that is. And my informant for that is, bless him, Roger White at the University of Birmingham. He worked at uh, Roxeter for many, many years. I found him because when I was trying to figure out where on earth I was working at Roxeter, I went to the Wikipedia page, a very long informative article written by one Roger White. And then I found out he was a co-author of a number of Roxeter publications, actually. I emailed him and bless him, he replied. He actually replied. And uh, so he told me about plum pudding. Now, in my plum pudding, we found very, very few things. Well, nothing actually, except one glorious thing, a Roman nail. I found a Roman nail. And it was so exciting because Roman nails are square in section. I had no idea you could have such a thing as a square in section nail. And bless him, Roger uh, told me the main publication of this, the British Museum catalog. This is uh, British Museum type one. And here's some pictures of it. He also told me about the, uh, this in, took, 
Hill find, which maybe some of you already know about, is an extraordinary find in 1960, where you know thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of nails were found in one pit at this site. They found so many nails, they didn't couldn't deal with them all. So they gave them to everyone. They gave them to the workers, they gave them to the people of town, they gave them all those. And, and in fact, uh, Roger, this is where I got these pictures from, Roger told me that, um, oh, and there were 28 round ones as well, not, not just the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, square section nails. Um, you can actually buy them on eBay. It was legal, right? This is so, a totally different sense of antiquities uh, from the into the nails. Yeah, good stuff. So it was a fascinating experience. Now, the other thing I found, which was even more amazing, was underneath all this wretched PP that was breaking my wrists, was a tessellated mosaic with white and blue geometric patterns. Amazing. It really felt like cheating because, you know, archaeologists don't find art. They, they dig through dirt and find things, uh, like nails. Um, anyhow, so there I was. I found this, this, this amazing thing. And bless him, Roger White gave me the pictures of uh, the later discovery of this, this mosaic. In fact, um, I learned a number of very important things at Roxeter. I learned definitely the value of careful scraping, really careful troweling to get your material. I learned that mud-based structures are actually made also of other things, also wood with nails. And I also had to get a bigger trowel. So I did that, I did that. Next step, absolutely. Now, and this was my problem, is I had this strong memory of PP and nail and mosaic, but where was I? I couldn't figure out where I was. And we actually went to Rockster a couple of years ago. The landscape has changed entirely since then. Um, and that, but that's where, that's where uh, English Heritage website came out. Very, very helpful. Uh, here's Rockster with the aerial view of it right now. And it tells you, you can see it shows the excavated remains of Roman Rockster, the basilica in the foreground, Peter Room's main bath suite, latrine to the right, and then the market hall, the McKellum, and the later Western bath uh, suite in the central courtyard. So, wow, okay, I was there. I do remember there being a bit of a road beside the, beside the site, and yeah, and people were digging across the road at the other side too. Um, um, but where was I actually working? Was it the McKellum or was it the Bath's Basilica? Crikey, Basilica and Bath sounds very, very wonderful, but hmm. Anyhow, so it turns out that the tessellated mosaic was found in the north aisle of the Baths Basilica. So that's where I was working. Yeah, Ooh, okay. And it dates 150 AD, lovely. Now, this was all confirmed again by Roger White, which is very, very kind of him. He's now emeritus at the University of Birmingham, and he uh, was also excavating there in 1978. So we probably were, met each other, I know, at the, the school dormitory where we all spend our nights there. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, so that was Rochester. Great start, really interesting. And from there, in fact, I went to a variety of different locations. There's Rochester up in England. My, my major hope thereafter was to come to grips with Greek sites, Greek sites that we knew from the Greek historians, Herodotus, the major sites of archaic and classical Greece. That's what I wanted. So I went to Nocritus in Egypt um, for a couple of years, and then we went I went to Corinth, the excavations at Corinth, American School Project. And then uh, at Sardis, a couple of years in Sardis in Turkey. And then I was taking part in the Canadian project, the first Canadian uh, project in uh, Mytilene. Uh, and then Zagora. Yes, you've already heard about Zagora. And this, of course, is the one that was most familiar to all of you. Now, Nocritus. Now, Nocritus, as most people will know, uh, was a, a very important foundation by a number of Greek sites, Greek uh, city states, I should say, on the Canopic branch of the Nile, that Amasis, the pharaoh, gave them permission to found their city there, and to, it could be a trading emporium between the Mediterranean and Egypt. So very important. Now this this um, is a page grab. I'm sorry, it's not a very good picture, but it's from the British Museum website, which is documenting their current work on the Nocritus project. Alexander Villink in the British Museum has been going through all the Nocritus finds that the earlier excavators took back to Britain and uh, getting them all up uh, and studied properly. So now, how did I get to Nocritus? Well, this is where Dick Sullivan comes in handy again. 
He, as I mentioned, was a research uh, fellow. He had lots of money for his research grant. His specialty was the client kings of ancient Rome, the Eastern client kings. And so he published this book, The Near Eastern Royalty and Rome. So he's most known for. He was introduced, invited to be part of this project to be the site historian and epigrapher. So Dick put in an application for the funding and he, bless him, requested funding for three students to go along too, three Canadian students. And I was one of the three students, that was great. Now, I don't have a good picture of Dick. I'm very sorry. I've been looking all over, but I just don't have a good picture of him. So, Nocritus will be very well known to all of you for the extraordinary excavations of the 19th century, early 20th century by uh, um, Flinders Petrie, uh, followed by Gardner and Hogarth. And they found a number of uh, temples, major sites. Uh, they excavated there. They found, interestingly, a scarab factory. And if you go to the British Museum now, you can see this is taken from, I, I took last, I know, last year. Um, scarab, um, molds, terracotta molds to make scarabs from Nocritus. Anyhow, they also um, found uncomfortable truths, like the earliest finds there date well before the pharaoh masses. So there have been, pro there have been problems of chronology with the site. Their excavation created a big hole, and the big hole filled up with water. We, we called it Lake Petrie. It was Tend to be mosquito ridden, whatever, but there it is. There's Lake Petrie. And so the Nocritus project began. Al Leathered and Willie Coulson started it. They wanted to clarify the big questions about Petrie's work and Hogarth's work. And they started with a survey in the 70s. Uh, they identified one mound that looked promising for excavation. When we were there in the 80s, Willie, and Nan Willie Coulson and Nancy. Um, uh, Wilkie conducted a field survey in the wider region around Lake Petrie. Uh, Leonard directed the excavations, and the only place to excavate he could find was a mound just across a little canal from the village of Com um, Gave. And there's the village, and there's the canal of Com Gave. Now, we were given pre-season instructions. I actually managed to file, find the communications from, from Al uh, before this field season. I actually found them in my files. It's wonderful. So we were told to bring a small tent with closures at front and back and a floor to make sure that no critters could get in and get us. We were told to take a small cot, and this is so we could be elevated to ground around against scorpions being a problem. We were told to bring a mess kit that, that everything had to have a, a hole in it so it could be dipped into boiling water for hygienic reasons. The water tents, and you see there's our, some of our tents. He ended by saying, we are currently negotiating for the rental of a small house in Comgate. That's actually the, the house there. See, from the houses that I saw while there, I would rather live in a tent. <laughs> so we were in our tents across the canal from the mound. We took, uh, took care of ourselves fully. We took turns uh, cooking for the team. Uh, in our rosters of canteens. Um, we sometimes had fun doing that. Uh, we dined in that house on tables of trestle tables that we made. Um, there we are, dining. And, but notice that in the following year when we went back, 81, we were dining in a much more splendid space. That's because the man to whom, the family to whom the uh, excavation had paid rent for the first season had sufficient funds to paint the house and upgrade it for the second season. So we actually slept in the other rooms of this house. The women slept. The fellows had to go somewhere else. I never did find out where they were. There's some other, other house somewhere in the town. But so we were um, in this house very nicely. And so this is one small way in which uh, the Nocritus Project helps the local economy. Right, so there we are in our pup tents, right beside the livestock. <laughs> uh, and. Um, it, it was really extraordinary. I remember very vividly sleeping in the pup tents at nighttime, and mostly I was sound asleep, but the Muslain call is magical. You could hear it throughout the night calling across the landscape of Nocritus. It, you really felt the, 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 the voice of centuries was around you, and you could feel the power of that call to prayer. Wonderful. Uh, but in fact, it was also quite cold. We quickly realized that though Egypt in uh, summer is hot, um, it is cold at night. And so we found ourselves indeed of aid for the heat. The, uh, the 
project expediter went off to was sent off to, to Alexandria to buy some blankets. That was great. Came back all these lovely wool blankets. We tucked ourselves into them that night, but they were full of fleas. Yeah, it was horrible. So, I mean, I, you know, in, in comedy, you hear lots of jokes about fleas, and I now fully, fully comprehend why they're funny because they, they're really, really, really itchy. And I even had a flea. I could find the bite pattern. You know, it would hop up my leg, three jumps, one, two, three, biting at each spot in a row. I had flea bites. And this is really rude, I think. Anyhow, so, so um, yeah. The next year, we all brought sleeping bags. So once a week, we got to go to Alexandria. The trip to Alex is very, very important because there we stayed in a hotel that had plumbing. We could wash and they have toilets too. Um, they had you know, real beds to sleep in and somebody else cooked our meals. We ate at a restaurant and we had interesting food, nice food, cleanly served on a real table. It was so good, yeah. So we really enjoyed our weekends in Alex. It gave us the energy to carry on. Now, I show you this photograph with the circle here because that is Dick Sullivan. Dick um, was a, a great player um, um, in this. He um, uh, spent a lot of time waiting for inscriptions. The survey project did bring inscriptions, and he spent a lot of his time washing the survey project's pottery. And he actually found some graffiti on the pots. So he actually did manage to find some inscriptions, so which he was able to publish when the publication finally came out. But meanwhile, he did a lot of just good helping around. And there he is getting ready to go to the Alex. Okay, village life. So many wonderful things about living in Alex in, 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 in uh, Comgate. I mean, we just you really were in the midst of, of a small village that, that um, yeah, so we had our, our well, I, I, I thought of it as a nine o'clock camel, a, a donkey, but actually it's a camel that went by every day at the same time. And they have, we have uh, camels also laden with other things, as you can see. Uh, note the men are wearing their, gal wearing their galabias. Um, we had a family just around behind our house who were just lovely people. The little boy there in the front was a real rogue. He just, he, he's constantly pesking himself around. He's lovely. Um, and on the right there, you can see ladies making bread in there. I don't know what they're called. The, the flat, the flat um, baking pans. Anyone know what they're called? Egyptian bread. Anyhow, in, in their home, that, that was them making bread. Very, very friendly, lovely people. And you, of course, you're, yeah, you're wondering about the archaeology. That's what we were there for, right? Yeah, okay. So, yes, we did dig. We did actually dig. It's true. Um, and here's a view of some of us digging. We um, excavated at the top of the South Mound, and there was a cemetery. Now, Petrie had uh, mentioned a cemetery and said they had excavated all the graves, and he had put the human remains into a modern graveyard, a modern cemetery. But in fact, we found some. We found 17 burials. Now, the Nocturnes Project chose to study the burials rather than re-bury them to add to the social profile of the town. It was very interesting. And this is where the two other Canadian students who were, who were going to the site were very important. We had Joanne and Jean, who were students at Simon Fraser University doing physical anthropology, and they were specializing in the analysis of human remains. So they had a wonderful, I can't go into details, but it was fascinating watching the work because they had charts which showed all the bones, the bodies, and they ticked them off as they found them and recorded what they were. It was really great. Um, and here they are engaging in some of their work. Their remains, oh, their remains, I'm sorry, their findings were published in chapter nine of the human remains of the publication that came out in 1997. Now, I'll pause for a moment just to say, this publication came out very, very late. I was really glad to be asked to do this talk so I could actually find the publication and read all about it. Um, poor Al apparently uh, lost a lot of the materials. There was a terrible accident in the States after he got it all back. And he had to, uh, I had been, I'd been told this by somebody a few years ago, um, he'd had to kind of recraft all the material for the project uh, to publish it. And that's why it came out so many years later. So they wrote a very important, interesting chapter and about this. Uh, much of what we found were, well, the graves like this. You can see the graves are different kinds of, of, of burial design. I just reoriented these to the north so they, you can see how they're oriented. But what was really shocking was that 80% of the population were children, young children, and 50% were neonates, infants, right? There was a shocking infant mortality in this village. 
Now we heard, I've not written this down before, but we've heard that the, the cemetery was, was especially um, ceased to be used about a hundred years previously. So we're looking about 19th century um, infant mortality in this region. One um, burial was of particular concern. Locus 150, one, sorry, one, 1556, I found it in the publication. This is an extraordinary burial. It's the saddest thing I've ever, ever seen. It was a, um, a grave with just one skeleton in it, a baby, disarticulated bones, and on top of them, neatly lying on top, a fully articulated skeleton of a rat. In other words, the rat had got into the burial, had eaten the baby, and then died of whatever the baby had died of, I guess. Uh, but it's just uh, too, I mean, really horrible, just a horrible, horrible thing to witness. And I found the publication uh, uh, in Alice's publication, Infant Burial in Silty Brown to Try to Soil Matrix Tomb 1, uh, 1550. So I actually found the tomb on this map, on the plan. Uh, desiccated burial, articulated complete rodent skeleton found with remains disturbed. So that's the official report of this incredibly sad um, story. But other things are happier. We spent a lot of time washing pottery. Well, the survey team spent a lot of time washing pottery. We didn't at all. And they, they laid it out on, on mats on the ground and, and so on and so forth. So artifact processing was a major part of life in this environment. Really luxurious surroundings in, in the second year, we actually had a fly screen so that the mosquitoes couldn't bite us while we were processing pottery. Now, the second stage of excavation was along the sides of the mound to try to get some sense of the stratigraphy of the mound. Uh, it, you can see even from this photograph that perhaps you can make out, I don't have a means of touching it, but you can see courses of mud brick in the view. Can you see that? Yeah. So it was clearly a mud brick structure. This, the work was mostly pick work. Uh, but as I've written here, I now had a five inch trowel so I could actually dig better. Yeah. Ooh. Anyhow, um, we. Oh, sorry, just to put a, a, a circle around that, that uh, 15, that was my trench there. Okay, so we engaged a number of sondages on the side, the side of the mound and decided to work at several levels to, because we, could, we didn't have enough time to get right at the bottom. In these four photographs taken on the same day, there's somebody at the lowest level, you can see the hand waving up, I trust. Yeah, okay, yeah. So at the end of the season, we hit water, the water table, right. And here is a, a section of the trench showing coarse mud brick, which we excavated. Yes, it was definitely mud brick because we excavated through it and water at the bottom, lovely. Now, and this is where my, I like to think of myself as Albert and Meg, not quite Indiana Jones, don't have a horse whip, don't, you know, can't shoot, but there I am uh, in my sondage with my, uh, yeah, <laughs> equipment and working at uh, my notebook. Now, yes, this side, these photographs remind me very much, of my, I'm really embarrassed about this. We went off to Egypt dressed like, you know, North Americans. I had my wonderful one piece outfit, which was so cool in the Egyptian heat and humidity. It was great. Except that if you look at what all the villagers were wearing, they were totally covered. Men as well as women, totally covered. Here I was being a sort of 70s feminist and I wasn't gonna take care of what, care what anybody said about how I should dress or how I should behave. In fact, I must've been incredibly offensive to all the villagers wearing this outrageous exposed body garb. So I'm a bit embarrassed about that. Anyhow, what I learned there. Recording, okay, Gezer method. Every page of a notebook should have on the left side, the top plan of what you've been digging, and on the right side, the description of the, of the uh, corresponding stratigraphy, shall we say. And I've got here all the names of di in different sites, lots, locuses, buckets, buckets, um, baskets, zimbili. Um, every site has its own terminology, but they're basically the basic stratigraphic units that you're using. I, had, I learned that I had to take, when I was using a line level, to put the line level at the edge of where we're holding it, because if you put it in the middle, um, the string sags there, and you're not getting a straight uh, measurement. Very cool. Now, of course, this is old fashioned technology, but I have to point out, by taking this photograph on our pool table, I realized that our pool table at home is in fact not totally horizontal. That, that will explain why I never managed to get my balls in the right place, of course. Yeah, anyhow. 
Okay, but the other thing I learned is that mud brick structures can be really, really big. Um, this one, uh, they, the publication came out, is 15 meters wide and uh, over nine meters in height, as it survives. Yeah, where was I working? Here again, I had to go back to the publications to figure out where I was. And this is where um, the British Museum were incredibly helpful because in the Nocritus project, they actually went back to Nocritus and, and excavated there. They found that the house we were living in uh, had been destroyed. Well, it had, was there for first year and then it was taken away and a modern building put in there more recently. But he um, was working through the old materials and he pointed out that I was actually working at Trench 15. That's how I know I was in Trench 15 on that plan. But he also pointed out that um, the south mound we were excavating was the south wall of Petrie's great Temenos. And there's Tom Gave down beside it. So that helped. <laughs> Final night at Nocritus. It was, it was a lovely occasion. We, we all had dinner together with our, our neighbors and hosts. And uh, then our final day, we all said goodbye and went away. What happened afterwards? Well, Al decided that it would be more promising to excavate at Kum Hadad because every time we got down to uh, the end of the mud brick, we hit water. And they found that in the survey. I went instead to Athens, where I was going to be a regular member of the American School of Classical Studies there uh, in 1981 to 82. Now, in Athens, the, the American School has this extraordinary program of, of a year-long program of interesting students to the sites of Greece, museums of Greece. It's just a great chance uh, to work there. And I'm really happy to say that my wonderful colleagues, Leslie and Stavros, have created an Australian version of this. We, the Athens Intensive Summer School, happening this summer, um, is the University of Sydney's way of getting students from our part of the world to Greece to experience the materials that otherwise you'd learn only in books and it's much better to see them in reality, in their landscape, in their scale altogether. So, uh, Les, Stavros, and Leslie, wherever you are, wave your hands. And I trust some of you may be graduates of it. If not, go this summer, okay? Good. Now, in Athens, there um, we had the start of the term um, party. And we had a t-shirt party in September. There I am dancing with my Leonard Excavation Company t-shirt. I was a graduate of the Nautilus Project. There we go. See, there's me. But also, note the character with whom I'm dancing. Yeah, it's Eric. <laughs> he had been off studying in Germany and wherever, while well, I was in wherever I was, and then he went off to study law, and then he came back. He kind of finally came back to classics. Okay, so there we are, um, <laughs> dancing the bump. Uh, you probably don't even know what the bump is, do you? Oh, good. I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm not the only fossil here. <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, so now the the, the American school. Uh, program was excellent. At the very end of the program in April, all the students, the regular members, are invited to take part in a project in, at Corinth, the American uh, excavations at Corinth, ancient Corinth. And uh, there we have a, a couple of weeks of, of ex excavation experience. You can see the training session we had the year that we were there. And that's one of our friends actually standing right in front. But you'll notice something really interesting. All the um, uh, North American looking students are standing up. And all the people actually doing work are Greeks. There's a very, very well experienced team of Greek workers, excavators at Corinth. Anyhow, so the project here was to go down from the, from the ground level down to real dirt, pay dirt, as it's called, yes, uh, which is in this case is Roman remains. Now, people who know about Corinth and ancient history know about its huge importance in the archaic period, major player in Greece. And Oh, golly, I'm taking far too long, aren't I? I'll just go through Corinth pretty fast. Um, and it has a pottery that was traveled all over the, the Mediterranean and so on and so forth. But the problem with Corinth is that, oh, the gorgeous, gorgeous thing about Corinth is that it's a really well-established uh, 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 excavation site. Uh, compared to Nocritus, we had beds, we had tables, we had, um, you know, all, sorts, all the good things in life, right? Yeah, and uh, we had good dinners. And this, this is, in fact, a team dinner here, but actually it's a birthday dinner with uh, one, of the, one of our team, team members. Um, we, but R Corinth, despite its Greek past, was especially a Roman city because Mummius Blasium destroyed it in 146 BC. And then the Romans built this wonderful, big, exciting city on top of it, which is all that you can find right now. Now, the challenge um, is to excavate there. Now, with this map, I figure out where I was. See green, that was where we were excavating. 
here's a sector I was excavating. I even found my square name on the publications. That's great. And what was very fun about it is I had a classical mosaic next door and I had a Roman uh, uh, wall painting in front of it. It's also next door. And what I found was, yes, here we are digging. Roman pottery, lots of Roman pottery. Yeah. And we found a Roman wall, Romans, deep, deep walls, deep foundation. And, and um, uh, they cut right through everything that predecedes them. And yes, so we have remains in the walls, right? Of prior Greek structures destroyed by the Romans. But what my trend specialized in was a pit. Yeah, there it is, my pit, yeah, ooh. Now, my pit clearly antedated the Roman structure on top. My pit uh, went down into bedrock. My pit ended up being really deep. And uh, uh, Mr. Williams, the director, called it the cookie jar because it just looks so tantalizing. It must have been built for something. It must have held something. So we dug through it. Um, you know, I, I, no, no section was ever made, so I kind of made this up with, with shapes. And um, the top meter was full of Roman shirts. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Roman. Yeah. And then, well, my trusty um, Thanasi actually did the digging of the rest of those three meters down there. I helped Christos next door with the um, fresco, and we were giving him boxes to help him put fresco fragments in. So I was being really, really helpful. So done the thing right down the very bottom. It was empty. There was nothing there. What a disappointment. The cookie jar was empty. Right. And then it's described in the excavation report as, but we found Neolithic shirts and shirts that made, were Middle Corinthian. In fact, these shirts were found in my trench. How come I didn't notice that? Because I wasn't doing the digging. I was just recording in the notebook. Right. We even found a Corinthian transfer out for us. Great, because we had them at Sardis. And we also had them at Zagara. Okay, so I learned how to work with a very experienced equipment workman who sometimes took the mickey out of you. And uh, sorting pottery with Mr. Williams, he's a master at pottery. And also the value of post-excavation study. In fact, I only learned about all this by reading the reports. So. On to Sardis. Okay, Sardis is a great Lydian site. King, King uh, Croesus, king of the, of the sort of Lydian uh, estate, very, very wealthy. Richest Croesus was a well-known uh, uh, phrase. And there's the Acropolis of Sardis. Now, his wealth is said is based on the, the Pactolus River, uh, which brought gold, electrum and gold, alluvial. And in fact, the Croesus, the coins, are the purest gold coin ever. In the summertime, it's quite a small stream, but in wintertime, it gets really, really big and strong, and it washes down gifts. Uh, directors at Sardis call them the Pactolus gifts. This particular one was washed down. They, they arrive for the summer season, and the Pactolus has given them things over the course of the winter. Well, this is one of the gifts. This is a stele that was found. And what's really exciting about this one is it actually has a Lydian inscription. There's very few Lydian inscriptions that survive, but also, it's uh, stylistically dated of the early fourth century, yes. But also it shows a man holding an animal proton drinking vessel and a drinking bowl. This guy is drinking in Persian fashion. Lydian inscription, Persian drinking style, how fun. Okay, another Pactolus gift that came in two separate occasions, 69 and uh, 1977, with the two halves of a pediment just showed up. And here too, uh, you see a drawing that they wondered what, what it's from, like maybe from a tomb, um, it's possibilities of how it was restored. Um, uh, but note here too, these guys are drinking in Persian fashion on this Lydian too. Great fun. Okay, so Sardis had a number of important directors. George Hanfman was the one who founded the project and he excavated there for many, many years. Um, he was especially, well, I'm gonna, we don't have time. His successor was, was Crawford Greenwald, we called him Greeny. Um, and he was the one who was directing at the time that I was working at Sardis. Nick Cahill is the current director at Sardis. Now, uh, the excavation compound, lovely trees planted by um, Hoffman at the very beginning, now glorious shade, wonderful birds there, everything lovely. The site, uh, Nick is working hard and has found out the site is huge. You see all that purple line around? That's the whole city wall. What we were excavating uh, was only one small part of it. The first focus was, was the Roman baths and Pactolus River. The second focus was where we were, MMS, monumental mud brick structure. Yes, mud brick, <laughs> uh, part of the wall. And um, more recently, uh, the focus has been more to the east, where in fact the Lydian city was. Now, 
the, the highway was, was removed recently, so you can actually go there without being run over between one side or the other. That was great. Now, I won't go into detail, but basically my first season there, I spent uh, all season digging 14 feet down, huge uh, Roman dump full of late Roman ceramics to get to um, a Roman uh, colonnaded street. And underneath it, just a little bit, you could see Lydian wall. Okay, and uh, the one photograph that I have of the site that was given to me, all you can see is a stage photograph because I've got a paintbrush in hand, painting delicately over this miserable marble lion head uh, water spout because it was the only thing that wasn't a grotty worm and courseware shirt that I found that whole season. Oh, I found some coins and some glass too, yeah. But okay, so Lydian strata below, but this is the monumental metric structure, huge thing, right? And that's the public photograph to see. It was built uh, uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, my second year was digging in a trench that on one side had steeply sloping stratigraphy, on the other side, mud brick, coarse mud brick. And I scraped it very carefully, scraped it carefully, proved it was mud brick. It's first thing in the morning with a good careful scrape. You could see the individual bricks. You could see their outline. And they were 30 centimeters square, those bricks. So I scraped them, I could find them, I proved them. But nobody believed me because they all came to look at my trench at noon, by which time it, the sun had dried them all away. The line, nobody could see anything. They didn't believe me. So one day I was really clever. I got my trowel and I scraped the outline of where the bricks were when I could see them the first thing in the morning. When they came later in the day, they said, Meg, you're, you're creating your evidence. This is not true. Well, I, at that point, I just gave up. See, what I, what I actually found, I can see now, was I was on a glacis going down from the mud brick wall and the mud brick wall. That was what my trench was covering. Years later, I should say, Greeny uh, told me uh, when I saw him somewhere that, yes, I was right. I had had mud brick. And yes, that was the glacis that I had. So that was reassuring. Anyhow, I left in high dudgeon <laughs> and went off next to the Middle East. The Middle East is another place, very famous, very, very famous in the archaic period. Yeah, great stuff. Um, Famous for the uh, poets, um, you know, uh, Alcius and Sappho, uh, famous in many ways. And there was the first Canadian Archaeological Institute at Athens, now the Canadian Institute in Greece uh, project. We started in at this, about the same period, Mytilene and uh, Stimphalus, which are both still going. And the directors here are Hector Williams and Jerry Schaus. Now, I was a pr happy, proud founding member of the Canadian Archaeological Institute of Athens. Look at us all there, our, our board sometime in the 80s. Um, yes, and Jacques Perrault. You see Jacques is there? Some of you know Jacques. Yeah, yeah, well, there he is, right there. Um, the tallest ones, we had to stand in the back, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Middle East at that time was famous because the, the discovery by Keratonides of the House of Menander, the so-called House of Menander, called that because an extraordinary uh, mosaic pavement survived there. Now he was engaged in, ex in salvage excavations right throughout the west side of Mytilene as the town grew from a small city town to a modern high rise kind of place. Now there's the whole pavement as does, is displayed now in the Mytilene Museum. Now Menander is a new comic poet, right? He, he, he was composing the fourth, late fourth century, early third century BC. This mosaic is third century AD. It just is great testimony to the survival or the interest in the Romans of, of their classics, as it were. But, okay, that's why Mytilene was famous archaeologically. Um, where we were going was somewhere else. We were going to the North Harbour site, where the Blue Circle is. Uh, it was a synergasia between the, the uh, Canadian Institute and the 10th Ephoria. And Aglia Akondidu was the Ephor at the time. We met her at Andros. Now, um, the site, uh, Hector, bless him, gave me this photograph because I had none at all. And I asked him, do you have anything? Uh, and he, he, he found this one, he gave it to me. So we were working in a Roman peristyle building, big problem with water table. Okay, that's lovely, except that typical story, mixed story, you go through lots of good Roman stuff. Yeah, Roman stuff, Roman stuff. And I even found a piece of glass. Now I had no idea that Romans had glass. I mean, you probably all know this, but there was this window pane glass. I, mean, I knew about glass vessels, but there's a window pane glass. And um, I said, wow, window pane. What, you know, and everyone said, well, of course they've got, had window glass. That glass all over Pompeii. Didn't you know that? No, I didn't. No. Anyhow, this particular example is from a, a site in Britain. I was able to find a photograph of an actual piece of Roman glass. And there you go, that's it. But the other thing I found underneath all this Roman stuff at the water level, the water table, was a lot of grayware, Aeolian grayware. And uh, um, Hector, in fact, reminded me of this, which is the super. The, um, I, I show you here, not 
from Mussolini, but from Zagara. Thanks to that experience, I was able to recognize when we had a lesbian trans at Zagara because I'd worked with it already. Yay, good stuff. And my trial by this time, you can see, got quite worn. It had worked very hard. Right. Now, in town, this is just a little anecdote here, to us in time. In town, um, we stayed in a, a house with a, a um, sort of marble paved back, backyard. And a couple of uh, the colleagues working on the project thought, it's an interesting looking pavements. So they lifted them up and they found one was a Greek inscription and another one had a reef sculpture on it. In other words, Archaea were everywhere. It's ancient remains were everywhere. And that's, that's the problem if you live in a place like this where the history is ever present, almost overwhelmingly ever present. And I should say that one of the first publications that Hector and Caroline Williams did of their work at Mussolini was a, um, why have I forgotten the word? Leftover stones found in medieval walls. Thank you, Spolia. Yes, Spolia study. <laughs> yeah, they well before Spolia studies were popular, they wrote a Spolia study of the Byzantine walls of Mytilene with all the Greek and Roman buildings that they preserved. So great fun. Now, um, yeah, there it is, Spolia studies. <laughs> okay. Um, later on, oh, I shouldn't mention this, but Hector found in the following year a vampire burial a skeleton that had been hammered with seven nails into his um, uh, wooden sarcophagus. Yeah, amazing, but that wasn't me. And then we get to Zagara. Good, I've got five minutes still. Okay, good, yeah, Zagara. Wow, Zagara. Okay, now look, uh, when I arrived in Australia, I knew about Zagara. We all knew about Zagara. It's the only site in Greece where you have real occupation evidence for the archaic period. It was in all, it's all, all the handbooks. We all knew about it. We knew about it because of the excavations of Alexander and Pitigli, who'd been working there in the 60s and 70s. And we all knew these, the, 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 the drawing, oh, hang on, I'm wearing it. <laughs> Jim Colton's drawing of, of a, a restored section of a house at Sagaraj showing um, the, the, the columns oh. flanking the hearth, the, the um, uh, 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 pithoi in their stands and their triangular windows. And, um, we also knew this plan. So when I arrived in Australia and Alexander said that, you know, there was still possibly something good that could be done at Zagra. Why don't you think about reopening the site? I couldn't believe it. I thought, you know, it wasn't an option. It was incredibly exciting because finally, after all these years digging Romans levels of Greek cities, <laughs> no, please, I, if any of you are Roman fans, please, excuse me. I, I'm not anti-Roman. I just, I'm anti-Roman levels on Greek sites, okay? Uh, right. Uh, here was a chance to work at a site where no Roman had ever been, ever. Well, actually, one of the survey people came back with a Roman shirt from one of the distant, uh, uh, and that, that, I, I almost burst into tears when that shirt came, but, but, but actually it was from far away, not on the site at all. Anyhow, so here we have, here we have this amazing chance to get, get a real handle of life as lived in the 9th and 8th century BC. How wonderful. Now, first visit. Well, we planned this, this wonderful conference and... Um, to bring together different people involved in the project uh, and all that. Disaster, uh, fairy strike, and wonderful Leslie rises to the challenge of the impossible. Booked, ordered, planned a helicopter flight for some of us to get to the site. Yeah. And there we are. And there's Jim Colton, who came with us. The architect, who just did these wonderful drawings, came with us to that conference and came with us uh, on that visit. Very, very important. And I think that's huge. Doing things with cameras. He was doing very good things with cameras all the time. And there he is doing things with cameras. Yes, good. Mm. Now, um, this first visit, we got wonderful aerial views of the site. There it is. Uh, it's an extraordinary place, location, high up above the waters, and so on and so forth. Um, and from that, the Zagra Archaeological Project was founded. Yes, great moment. Now, I was one of the happy directors of the project. Um, there's Leslie and Stavros also uh, happily being directors of the project. It was really good stuff. And I'm wearing the same clothes deliberately. The, the shirt's a little bit more worn out now, but you know, for the occasion. Yeah. Now, Paul came to join us. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't find a good picture of you in the field. I just couldn't. I was, uh, yeah, there we are. Anyway, here's Paul being Paul. And he also excavates. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now the one thing, of course, we knew from Alexander's work 
was um, there's a lot of information about houses and we had pictures like this. So, so it showed us interior spaces, interior fireplaces, um, where, where the, the pitho were stored and other vessels. So we had all that kind of information. What we were trying to do, what we were trying to do is build on what Alexander did, right? And the first project, the first challenge was to find what Alexander did. In other words, to get, get, on, a, to get the site and on the site grid. And this is where Jim Colton was really, really helpful because he helped us showing the, the basic points uh, that he, had been his reference points uh, from which we could build our own, our own grid. And um, of course, a major figure in all of this is Andrew Wilson. I'm so glad you're here, Andrew, because we couldn't have done any of this, any of this at all without you. All of it, yeah. <laughs> I don't have any good pictures, but there we go. Um, so photography, a very important of Zagara. And we went through from the humblest to the most elaborate. So uh, first season, yeah, slinging a camera across a line. Yes, that was good. Uh, next season, uh, Hugh had, a Kite photography helping him. And then we had uh, little flying machines that took pictures. What are they called? Thank you, thank you. Yes, drones. Yeah, I'd say my technology and uh, my, my linguistics is not very good. And then we got thermography happening. I, I drew this from the, uh, the 2019 report, which is coming out very soon, everyone. Do read it, it's really exciting, okay? Um, where we have fascinating new developments in uh, photographical applications for archaeology, or archaeological applications for photography. Right. So that's Hugh, yay, Hugh. Uh, Kristen. Uh, was uh, very helpful in her work. Well, I guess what I'm saying is we have so many wonderful people working on our team, each of whom contributed different things. Kristen focused on the history of the town qua town and emphasized that we think this oh, short-lived site, you know, come and gone, here and gone. We, it lived for about eight generations. We have eight generations of development from small, few houses outside, uh, apart uh, on the landscape. It's a really crappy landscape. I thought it was a solid plateau. No, no, no. There's deep crevices all over there. And so people who lived there first had to find a place that was flat to put their houses on. And then gradually they filled in the holes with their garbage. Wonderful garbage, right? Good for us to excavate. And then they expanded their houses on top of the garbage. So here we have uh, one case of a house. Um, um, here's a, 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 yeah. Jim Colton knew all this, of course. He knew that it was, it was start, built like this. Um, and then the houses expanded, they filled in the, the crevices, they could make the houses bigger, gave themselves courtyards, do living work and all that kind of stuff. Ah, yes, Beatrice. One of the things we, they had was very big pithoi. So big that probably the, the room was built around the pithos because you couldn't get through the door. But Beatrice is our pithos person. She wrote the first and for a long time, the only serious study of pithoi. Now, Ah, that gets us to our, our wonderful discovery. If anyone here was ex in 2013 and took part in the excavation of Trench 7, uh, this was where we have Hughes aerial photograph. Thank you so much. Um, oh, sorry, this is a kite, which Adam helped with. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have a, a view of the room and a whole room occupied with one single shattered pithos. Oh, there are a couple of fragments on the else too. One pithos covered the whole floor of this room. Now, um, we even had pithos lids, that's not great. Amazingly, this was a decorated pithos. And one person turned over a piece to pick it up and take it away, and there it was. The imprint of the decoration was still on the soil. So, uh, happy picking up a pithoi <laughs> and uh, finding interesting patterns on them. Uh, can't go into the details, but the one I love is, is goats being attacked by snakes that look like meanders. Um, but anyhow, so amazing pithoi found in this place. And how many, how heavy were I mean, we carried them all up in one day. Anyone remember how heavy that was? It was kilos and kilos and kilos. It was a very hard day for the team. Everyone had to carry two or three loads up. Anyhow, that's by the by. Okay, other important thing, ceramics. Of course, the pithoi lead to ceramics and our ceramic specialists. Beatrice for coarse wares and Stavros for fine wares, constantly guiding us through what we were doing. Now. Here's Beatrice examining a shirt in the field. She's watching Beatrice look at a shirt is, is wonderful. She really studies the ceramics. It's great. She's also been studying this new technology that we have at Saigara. It's not um, coiled uh, making of vases, but they pull the clay up from inside. They call it drawing method. And she's, she's documenting it from uh, elsewhere in, in the, well, the modern world. It seems to be done by women rather than male potters. And um, I won't go into the details now, we don't have time. But she's doing really exciting stuff and, and finding, working with colleagues elsewhere, working in the Mediterranean, 
uh, to examine this phenomenon and the spread of this technology uh, more broadly. But you can only do it with certain clay, and we have the right clay. So we're making these pots at Saigara. God knows where, but we're making them there. Okay. But one thing that shocked all of us when we got there is everywhere you went, there was slag. All across the whole site, there was slag. There was even one place where slag was, uh, as you can see here, was a, a collapsed bench. So it had been built into the, bent, the Pythos bench. It had been hanging around the site when they built the Pythos bench, right? So everywhere. And that's where Ivana Veda has been so wonderful because Ivana just stepped up the challenge and learned all about metal. And she helped us come to understand that they weren't forging, they were smithing. Is got that right? Yeah, okay. And, and so, uh, so we have a sense of, we don't know yet where they were, well, we do, I won't go there. 2019 season, I can't talk about it. I'm not doing Zygara, right? I'm just doing people. Yeah, wonderful team. And we had uh, people dry sieving, then wet sieving, and this gave us good information about food. Unfortunately, um, COVID has interfered with, with some of the analysis of this material, but the preliminary uh, finds from all this were very helpful. Sea urchin, limpets, fish. I mean, we actually are in exploiting the maritime landscape here. Uh, it wasn't always that visible. Usually it was the, the animal, the red meat animals that were more visible around us. And in fact, um, I, oh, I did find a picture of piglets, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> as far as we can see, um, uh, uh, pork was, was the preferred diet because piglets are easier to, to manage. Uh, well, they reproduce regularly. And the, the pig uh, is a very helpful scavenger animal. Now, the sheep were used especially as uh, sec for secondary products, the milk and the, and the wool. Now, uh, Rudy especially worked on that with the help of, the, of Alexander's um, original funnel of studies. And more recently, uh, he's been studying the isotopic evidence of our material. And it's giving us fascinating further evidence into diet and also into livestock management strategies can come out through isotopic analysis, especially of teeth. But my favorite story, as I will say, is this is rabbits. We had two rabbit bones at Zagara from totally different sectors of the site, totally different periods. And they had exactly the same isotope uh, profile. In other words, um, it, there was a one place where rabbits like to live by the site. And if you wanted to have rabbit for dinner, you knew where to go. You got your rabbit and you brought it home. That was just great. Rabbits are good. Okay, now, um, so this is a farewell to Rudy as he's going off to, to Oxford to take part in his, to study the masters of archeological science and learn all about this isotopic stuff. Um, but what's really fun is that this material is move, moving other directions. And more recently, we've been working on carbon-14 dating of bones. And in fact, an article is just gonna come up very soon. It is, has, is part of the growing trend to argue that the material that we all thought was ninth century is actually 10th century. The evidence was first coming out of Italy but there's now two sites in Greece and Zagros, one of them showing that uh, the site was founded in the 10th century BC, which is just so extraordinary. Um, so uh, now when we think life has lived at Zagora, it's not 9th through 8th century, it's 10th through 8th century. Yeah, it's done. Okay, so Zagora life. In our studies, we have, in all the work we've done, we, we actually have helped, I think, clarify some of what Alexander found. When more of these, our evidence is, is fully analyzed, we'll be even further. I was gonna take away Boreas because I knew they'd run out of time. So it's cold there, we wear sheepskin hats. Uh, um, but we had wonderful teams and that's the great glory of working at Cycle Law. My colleagues, um, the directorial colleagues, uh, <laughs> Andrew and other colleagues, um, trend supervisors, uh, Irma, all the wonderful people. But we, we found that they left gradually. They left, they came back, probably when they were doing their sheep, I don't know, came back from time to time. And it's really not clear why they left. That's one of the big problems. But it's very clear that the next thing that has to happen at Sagara is coring at the springs. And that's something that, that uh, my triumvirate of co-directors are going to take care of soon, we hope. So we can find out whether, in fact, it was a change of water supply related to the what some people call the mini ice age that was in Greece uh, through the ninth, eighth, and seventh century or nineteenth century. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So two last important lessons. I want to share this with you. Okay. This is my co-directors. Wonderful, and also the modern technology. Um, Leslie said we should have 
team dinners and, and drinks on Friday night. But we also had trench supervisors giving presentations of their week's work. In other words, PowerPoint was possible. With digital images, it was possible. So that everybody who worked on the site could see what everyone else was doing. None of this going back 50 years later, as I was doing, trying to figure out where and if I was on site. Blah, blah, blah. My colleagues have designed this wonderful means by which our students could know where we were. And I hope that it, it's such a radical difference to have that. But the other thing that's really, really important is uh, Leslie and Stavros again planned to have a public lecture in Greek in, in uh, the main town of, of, of the island, explaining about our site, what our project was, and, and uh, to all the people there. It was full. It was amazing. Everyone came. And we invited them to come the following Saturday to come visit the site. We gave them a site tour. So here am I with a group of them uh, about to give the site tour at the start of the site. But the important thing here is that uh, so we showed them the site, and that was great. The comments I got back, one lady said to me, you know, archaeologists come, archaeologists go. They do things. We don't know what they're doing. They never tell us. This is the first time anyone has ever told us about our own island history. Thank you so much. Now, that, that, that was, for me, a very important lesson that Leslie and Stavros initiated. That was great. Good stuff. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Final slide. You'll be glad. I'm, I'm stopping soon. Look, I just want to say that I am so glad I came to Australia. I, I, it's not just because you have the most beautiful birds in all creation, right? You, so. but, but really... I have come here to such a community uh, with colleagues and students. I have such extraordinary students here uh, and, and, and such wonderful colleagues. And I, the colleagues in the department now, uh, um, each has their own strength. They work together and it's all very complimentary. And I'm really, I'm really delighted at, at how, um, well, everything can work despite all the challenges that come, that come our way. So, end of story. I know because people are online, I have to do this rather awkward thing. You know what? Um, we're really glad you came to Australia as well. I'm sure I speak for everyone in the audience. A Life in Ruins, a fantastic title. I wish I'd thought of that. It's just fabulous. And thank you for such uh, a wonderful and engaging walkthrough. It's a sprint through, really of all the exciting sites um, that you have uh, been part of and contributed to. It's been um, terrific. And actually, you gave me a little bit of an insight into your inaugural lecture. So I remember your inaugural lecture. Uh, and you, <laughs> no one else does, but I do. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I remember it, but... Um, it was on um, representations of Persians in Greek um, pottery and art and whatever. And there was one of the sites where you spotted it. So I, I, I'm guessing there's a bit of a, a lineage of, of an intellectual question and an intellectual trajectory there. Now, I remember it because um, I can say that I was dean of the arts faculty that appointed uh, Meg all those years ago. And just... I hope you'll bear a slight anecdote about the search for Meg. And actually, Dan Potts was kind of an important person in this whole process. And he came to me and he said, I think I found a really good person uh, for the role, this woman from Canada. And I said, oh, fantastic, great. He said, uh, but she's got a spouse. Okay. No, she's got a spouse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you mean I have to hire the spouse as well? <laughs> now, for those of you in the Australian context, a spousal hire is very rare and very controversial. In the North American context, that happens all the time. Everyone does spousal hires. Famously, Duke University hired the very famous literary critic, Frederick Jameson, and gave a job um, to his wife and his male lover. Um, <laughs> so that's the North American way, but it's not the Australian ways. And actually, there was a lot of resistance in the faculty to spousal hires, but um, Meg, you were the breakthrough. Um, 
it was you and Eric, and it was an opportunity, I think, even though financially classics and archaeology kind of didn't deserve it in money terms, um, we were had engaged very early on in my deanship in a rebuilding of classics, ancient history, and archaeology. And it was an investment in quality, an investment in the intellectual future, not just looking at the budget bottom line. And you have repaid that investment in spades and with your colleagues, with Zagara, ending up in Zagara is fantastic. I had the privilege of going with Alexander to Zagara, I think, 2010. Um, he hadn't been there since 1974, and we wandered into the museum and said, where's the Zagara stuff? And I said, oh, it's, you mean Professor Cambitoglu's expedition? And we said, yes, and this is Professor Cambitoglu. And the young woman behind the counter went, no, and, and ran, just sprinted out of the museum, just left us standing there. <laughs> we didn't know what to do. And she ran up the hill to the town hall and charged into the mayor's office and said, Professor Cambitoglu's here. And the mayor and the town clerk raced down the hill, met us all there and said, Professor Cambitoglu, the food is on us, the taxis are on us, it's all done by us. So we were ferried around here, there and everywhere. So the fact that I think you engage the, um, the people of um, Andros in um, bringing them to Zagra was a fantastic repayment of that generosity and support. So um, Meg, it's been fabulous having you. Um, I'm so pleased I made a really good appointment and um, you pay that in, uh, in spades and the colleagues here and online, I think it is a moment, as Leslie said, of sadness to see you go, but thank you for your contribution uh, to the community here, to the colleagues, to the students and to international scholarship more generally in your discipline. It's been great having you and we hope to see you around the corridors. Um, yes, yeah, excellent. I'm very pleased to hear that. Thank you for your talk tonight.